lately I've been finding it really interesting that people have been teaching and telling about somehow if you'll just give your life to God, that God will bless you. That you will have a wonderful life if you just come to Jesus. That you'll have an abundant life. That everything's going to be hunky-dory and things will be fine. No, they won't. As a matter of fact, if you're doing what God said that you should be doing, you will have tribulation. If you're doing the things that Jesus told you to do and has spoken in his word in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at the very end of it, it says, hey, look, you need to do these things because if you don't, your house is going to get knocked down bluntly. But he said, you will suffer persecution. You will go through these trials. You will have storms in your life. Things are going to happen. They will hit you right between the eyes. As a matter of fact, if you read any Christian literature from any century, you are told you will suffer. And so, you need to sit down and count the cost. You need to do wise planning, so to speak, as financial planners will tell you and all these people that are like self-help gurus who tell you, oh, well, only think positive because you want positive people around you because after all, everything's positive and you don't want to ever think anything negative. False. That's not true. You should sit down and look at the reality of what life is. Life is about living, first of all. So whether you do or not do anything at all in your life, with it or let it happen to you, life is still going to exist and it's still going to go on. You're going to live. And that's kind of what the reality of eternal life is, too. When you die physically, you're not going to end there and that's kind of you need to get a handle on that and go you know maybe take care of salvation but once you have you need to sit down and kind of like count the cost here if you are going to follow Jesus if you are going to be a Christian you need to sit down and weigh what that means Jesus said deny yourself take up your cross and follow me Jesus said it's going to cost you personally something you have to give up something oh sure I have given you my grace so that you could be saved and you may be saved and that salvation has been made available to you as a free gift but you are going to go through things that you can't handle life is going to dump you at times onto the bare pavement and if you're stark naked and you're not ready for it it's your own fault because I told you what to do this is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy may be full. This is the things that I've said to do. Assemble yourselves together, one another. Forsake not to assembling together the brethren, as, as uh, the nature of some is. Rather, but pray for one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, even more so as you see the day coming. Which one of you, that when you see your neighbor hungry, would not reach out and give him bread when he asks? Which one of you would see your neighbor naked, and when he asks for clothes, you would not give to him? so too your Father in Heaven will take care of you. So you see, Jesus did have some criteria, but he also warned us that there's some things we're going to go through. And you need to realize, to count the cost, that being a Christian means you are your brother's keeper. Counting the cost in ministry, I find for myself that once I had gone into ministry, my time was gone. It was like, whoops, you know, when am I going to do something for myself? I'm really not. Because I have to fight, scrape, and scrap you know, in order to really convince myself to be selfish enough to watch a football game or to do something stupid, you know, that quite frankly, when I'm in the middle of it, I don't want to be doing it. You know what I mean? I'm, I do it all the time. My wife laughs at me. I'll sit down and I'll say, well, you know, honey, I said, you know, I need to get away from the computer. I need to get away from doing some of this ministry stuff, you know. I said, I need to, I need to kind of watch a, watch a TV show or let's just watch a game, you know, or let's just go to a movie, you know, and sure enough, never fails. In the middle of a movie or middle of a football game or something, I'm thinking, man, you know, Lord, what, 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 what couldn't we do this, you know, and I get these ideas from God, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, you know, look at the game, you know, this is kind of like, you know, and God makes applicable lessons for me through whatever I'm seeing, hearing, and experiencing every day of my life. And so, 
I realize that if I want to do something, you know, selfishly, you know, really, my time's not my own. Not only that, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so because I have, I tend to lay my life down, not for myself, because I get such a cheap thrill out of being in ministry, but because it is something that accomplishes good in other people. What God wants to do isn't only for you, but it's for me too. Because you see, when I help someone, I'm helped. When I encourage someone, I'm encouraged. When I pray for someone, I'm prayed for. When I bless someone, I'm blessed. But you see, the opposite holds true too. When I curse someone, I'm cursed. When I yell at someone, I'm yelled at. When I beat on someone, I'm beat on. When I beat down someone, I'm beat down. When I judge someone, I'm judged. So you see, I kind of make unto myself a lot of the things that happen to myself because I am focused on myself. But when I'm focused on ministering to others, when I count the cost of judge not lest you be judged, then I know that if I don't judge, hey, I get away with it, so to speak. If you want to use kind of some really God logic here, if you want to get away with something, don't judge someone, period. If you want to get away with something, give them grace. And guess what? You get grace. If you want to get away with something, forgive them, and guess what? You get forgiven. Man, I kind of like that kind of philosophy, because then I kind of like, I duck under what I'm doing. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, I got some problems, so maybe if I forgive other people the problems I got, my problems will be taken care of. And the reality is, that's what Jesus said. So, counting the cost means that you are going to be changed. That means you're going to be compressed, you're going to be challenged, you're going to go through what people like to not say, the negative things in life. Right now there's this huge push on, don't be around negative people. Well, why not? Don't they need help? I mean, if you're a positive person, you should go find some negative people to help them. It's not a question of, oh, they're going to wear you down and infect you. Because that's what Christians are making the mistake of. A lot of these false teachers or false ideas, oh sure, they're going through learning, you know, and they're learning that, you know what, <laughs> these people wore me down, you know, so I don't like to be around negative people. Well, count the cost. Jesus came from heaven to earth. Quite frankly, everything he encountered was negative. <laughs> there wasn't anything that was heavenly here on earth. He brought it. And because he brought it, he denied himself his own glory and gave it up to bring down to earth what we could learn from him and experience so that we would share with one another his glory. And at some point in time, Jesus got a little selfish. You know, he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, hey, you know, bingo, God showed them my glory. Wow, bingo. Guess what? Three of his disciples were so amazed that they were like shocked out of their shorts. Later, John was like, oh my God, I now see who Jesus is. And he was like, as a man undone, we're told in the book of Revelation. So, part of counting the cost is realizing it costs to be a Christian. You do have to put up with people and learn to love them. You do have to change your attitude about, oh, don't let me be around negative people, but rather, let me inspire them to change their polarity to become positive about what they are. I have no problem with a perfectly 100% negative person. They always come up with the right thing to say on some things. It just seems to you that they're negative. To me, they're like practical. <laughs> because quite frankly, the Bible says, in me there dwelleth no good thing. And I have no problem with you know negative people because they remind me of things that I know I need to know from the scriptures. And what you may call negative, God may be seeing as positive. And so a lot of times it's a matter of perspective of realizing that if you're going to be a Christian, you have to count the cost. You have to get along with other people. You have to learn to love. It may take time, but the reality is you don't go shopping and chopping. You go where God tells you to go and then you learn to live with the people that are there. That's what counting the cost is all about. If you're going to be a Christian, be a real one. When you go into ministry, though, you don't really get a chance to even pick and choose too much. 
Because if you do, you lose. I mean, you can pick and choose who you want. You can try. But, you know, at some point in time, just like I've learned, you know, different things that you try to do that are like in your flesh, you know, like say you try to do some part of ministry, you know, and you think, oh, well, I'm going to jump out into this area. And it dies on the vine, doesn't it? It really doesn't happen for you. It's kind of like, you know, you really don't want to be doing it. Kind of like some things that I do sometimes where I say, oh, 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 you know, I want to I want to get up every day and exercise. No, I don't. But I have to find time now somewhere to do a little bit of exercise or else what I want to do, which is to record and to write and to develop and to edit, well, I don't really edit them, but to post them and to present them, you know, on the Internet, requires a lot of time. And so in order to be able to do that, I have to sleep and I have to eat, and so I have to incorporate that into my time right now, like even adding, as most people have seen in video, adding time to eating right in front of the camera, or drinking, or just being reality television. Hey, this is me. <laughs> yeah, I'm still getting cleaned up, you know, I'm shaving today, you know, I'm kind of, you know, doing my thing. Because I don't really have time to waste, I think, on myself. But I do have time to enjoy the presence of God with you. I do have time to actualize, so to speak, as they talk about people in sports actualizing their vision of what they choose to do, whether it be like winning a gold medal or you know running a race or you know putting or something. When you actualize God, you realize that He is real and that you're not making Him up. He actually is our reality. And that we don't have to actualize anything to make it happen, but that God happens just like life happens. God happens in your day if you're willing to look and see Him and find Him in the day that you have decided to watch for Him. And that's what you have to do when you're a leader in ministry. You have to watch for the Lord. He may choose to invade your day and to visit you just like he did at Jerusalem. He came as God and said, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets. How I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. You shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Interesting that Jesus visited them. And he also warned at others to watch for the hour of your visitation. At some point in time, God wants to invade your day. He wants to interject himself in your living out your life. He wants to cause you to count the cost of saying you're a Christian and actually being a Christian. Because he'll come to you, whether in some poor man crying out for clothing or quarter, whether it be your spouse crying out for love and affection that you've denied them or denied her or him, or your children that you've neglected in some way by not getting along with your mate and then divorcing and now they're scarred and hurting, whether it be your church that you've left behind tragedy and you haven't restored relationships, you really need to count the cost because Jesus did. He knew when he went down and came for you. He knew what he was doing. He saw what the accomplished purpose would do, and he ran with joy, so to speak, and was in anxiousness and angst unto his own death because he wanted so much so for you to know that the cost of being the Son of God was that he was also going to be the Son of Man, and that as a son he would obey his father even unto death. And the cost of being a Christian is you do die to yourself. You do learn to deny yourself. You do learn to take up your cross and crucify yourself. Because until you do, you're faking it pretty well. You, know, you may be making it by grace, but guess what? Life is going to smack you right in the face. And you'll come to death. And then you'll face him. Alone? 
or with the grace of God that he's given you. So, count the cost. Look at what you're doing and what you're accomplishing. Evaluate how you're living your life. Evaluate what your Christianity is, really. If it's just religion and religious practices, or if it's relationship, or if you're learning to let God change you by what you're doing to other people and with other people. Because if there's a string of people that you know have bad vibes from you, behind you, it's time to change your ways. If you've done a lot of bad, you know, job references, you know, a lot of bad, you know, circumstances where you're some kind of political junkie and you're just pissing people off everywhere you go because you're standing on your own righteousness, you're not doing what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, if you're dividing and conquering, you're not doing what Jesus said. You ought to be counting the cost of what you're doing because your actions are speaking louder than your words. And you need to learn what the word was that Jesus gave to his disciples, that they would be one, even as his Father in heaven was one. Accomplishing that, he is going to smack you down at times, to the ground. Not because he's going to get you, but because he's going to let you see what you have accomplished in your life. He's going to let you have what you have sown. He's going to let you receive the recompense of your own actions and not protect you from the consequences of your own choice. That's probably the hardest thing, I think, in ministry to realize is that when you're a leader and when you're sharing the Word of God and when you're teaching and inspiring others to follow hard after Jesus, you see very quickly and very immediately the consequences of your own personal choice. And a lot of times that personal choice, it tends to hurt people. And you feel it. And you see it. And you know it. Because God puts it in front of your face. Now, you could ignore what God has said. And don't count the cost. You could say, ah, oh, no, I don't, I don't need to worry about it. You know, I'm, I'm taking care of it. God's going to present me for for the Father of the exceeding joy. You know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to get there. Well, you might. But you know, God never promised a rose garden, as we all say. God never promised that you would be excluded from suffering. God never promised that you would be excluded from the pain of following and knowing God. Tribulation is coming. Oh, the great tribulation is coming too, but there's, there's tribulation coming now. It's warring with your soul. There's tribulation coming now that's fighting with the land, as so to speak. There's tribulation for Christians on every side to make decisions and choices that they may make the wrong choice at times and go aside rather than follow the Lord their God and live in peace and love. The choice for you is to decide when you are making decisions, are you counting the cost of what it will take from you in order to do what you're making a decision about. And that's what Christians do. Because I can't look at lots of things I want to do and honestly say that I'm going to go do them. Because I don't have time. Time is short. And Jesus said that in these latter days, be sober-minded, be serious, get real, and don't be frivolous lest destruction come upon you suddenly. Count the cost. See if what you're doing is really what you want to be done unto you. Count the cost and see if what you're accomplishing is really what you want to show the Lord when your days are done. Count the cost and decide whether or not your life has been lived according to what Jesus said. Lordship to him would be. Because if it isn't, then might I suggest that you pay the price of being a Christian? You stand up and act like a man of God now? You change your ways and begin to humble yourself today to do what God wants you to do? Because you already know. 
you already have heard, you've already read, you already have the word, you already know God. But really, what you need to do is count the cost and see if you're able to finish your walk, your life, His will for you in what God has told you to do before the end of the world comes and before the end of your days is at hand. Count the cost. You may find that Jesus may have paid the price for your salvation, but have you paid the price to follow him?